Hey, everybody. Time for another batch of Linux forensics fun. Um, I am Mr. Rourke, your host. Uh, no, my name is Hal Pomerantz. Um, wow, I've been doing this a long time. Wow. Wow. Um, so, yeah, so uh, I started my career as a lowly Unix sysadmin back in the mid-1980s and uh, been doing the consulting thing for quite a while now. My consulting practice is, is largely uh, forensics, incident response, some expert witness work. Uh, I'm kind of known as the Linux forensics guy, I guess. And uh, as a result, I probably do more Linux investigations than the average uh, person. But um, so anyway, I, you know, for me, it's all it's all like uh, IT archaeology, right? I, I know what Unix and Linux machines are supposed to look like and I, I find the stuff that doesn't belong, and that's usually the bad stuff that people have uh, included in the in the operating system. Um, this uh, material that I'm going over today is actually an excerpt from a four-day class in Linux forensics that I teach uh, periodically. We've got a run of it coming up through Anti-Siphon uh, starting September 12th. Um, if you can't attend the training, all of my training materials are distributed under a Creative Commons license. So if you go to the archive.org link that's on this slide, you'll be able to download not only the course material, which is the PDF uh, of slides and my instructor notes, but you'll also be able to download the lab virtual machine with all of the hands-on labs and um, you know use it as a self-study. I, I think um, it's important that we do better sharing information like this. So um, all my stuff is uh, Creative Commons licensed. And that means you can do whatever you want with it, including remix it and, and teach it yourself as long as you uh, preserve the attribution of where you got the material from. Uh, there are my uh, contact information. If you have any questions about um, this material or anything really uh, after the class is over, Feel free to reach out uh, by email or social media, and we can talk about it. All right, so uh, what am I talking about today? So I'm going to talk a little bit about XFS, um, which is uh, a file system that was developed by Silicon Graphics back in the 1990s. Um, it was uh, designed to exploit their multiprocessor architectures. SGI was so the first Unix vendor, I think, to really go big on um, multiprocessor uh, servers and workstations. So they wanted a file system that was multi-threaded, um, that they could you know, have multiple write threads um, all going at the same time and try and improve performance. These days, of course, SGI doesn't really exist. Um, <clears throat> but the file system lived on because it was actually quite a, a good file system. Um, so XFS is part of every Linux operating system. Um, for a while, Red Hat was actually um, using it as their default uh, file system. So if you just did a Red Hat install with the sort of automatic uh, installation, you'd, you'd be running on XFS. Uh, in my investigations, a lot of the time that I'm dealing with XFS is when I'm dealing with some of those consumer grade network attached storage devices, you know, like the Synology and, and, and QNAP and, and those things. Oftentimes they're just embedded Linux machines um, on top of a XFS file system. The problem is that, um, you know, while we, we do see XFS pretty commonly um, in Linux investigations, the forensic tool support for XFS is really lacking. Uh, you know, Xways does support XFS, although I will say that I have, at least with older versions of Xways <coughs> that I've used, I've noticed some, uh, shall we say, discrepancies in the way Xways reports stuff from the way I would interpret the file system. There is a well-known branch um, off the sleuth kit where people have hacked in some XFS support, but it also is a work in progress. Um, so I would say if you're using Either one of those, you know, kind of trust but verify, um, because there are uh, cases where I don't think that they're reporting the information correctly. 
Um, and so what do you do, right? I mean, you, you know, you're kind of screwed now. It's like, oh, I, I can't necessarily rely on my forensic tools. Um, how am I going to do, you know, any kind of forensics on this, this file system? And so the answer is um, most file systems come with some sort of low level debugging tool that was created by the file system developers to help them when they're developing the file system and adding new features and stuff like that. So for example, um, there's debugfs for ext file systems. For XFS, there's a program called XFSDB, which is part of the XFS utilities uh, that come along with the file system. And <clears throat> while you know XFSDB was intended as a developer tool, you can actually use it uh, to do some interesting things from a forensic perspective um, and get kind of down and dirty with the file system. So I want to talk a little bit about XFS and I want to introduce uh, this idea of using XFSDB as a forensic tool, okay? All right, so um, XFS, uh, you know, it's a modern 64-bit file system. Um, it, um, uh, you know, has a journal. Um, it uses extents. Um, which NTFS you would call a cluster run. Um, it has uh, all four timestamps, so including a file creation date, 64-bit um, timestamps with nanosecond resolution. Um, up until the latest version of XFS, um, because it was based on the old Unix standard of 32-bit seconds since 1970, it did have the 2038 uh, rollover problem. Uh, the latest version of XFS actually has a new feature to extend the the life of the timestamps in XFS, and so that should get us past 2038 at least. Um, one of the interesting things, uh, you know, and this is only interesting if you look at file systems at a really low level, but one of the interesting things about XFS is that um, it's an entirely big Endian file system. Um, so all of the, the data is arranged in big Endian format, even on little Endian processor architectures like uh, Intel CPUs. Um, and this is historical because SGI, <clears throat> when the file system was being developed, used um, MIPS processors in their, in their SGI uh, equipment, which was a big Endian RISC processor. So um, it actually makes my life easier when I'm looking at things in hex because I don't have to do byte swapping and things like that. Um, okay, so basically, blah, 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 blah. It's a modern file system with all of the typical features that you would expect from a modern file system, which means there's a lot of complexity that you have to deal with when you're dealing with the file system as well. Now, one of the unique things, though, about XFS, and, and this is the thing that kind of makes it different, from other file systems is that a given file system is actually broken up into multiple what are called allocation groups. Um, and it's four by default, although you can choose the allocation number of allocation groups when you build out the file system. If you have a reason for you know, increasing or decreasing the number of allocation groups, you can do that. Each allocation group is basically an independent file system. It has its own uh, inodes, it has its own super block, and so on and so forth. Um, the idea is that you can write into each allocation group independently in parallel without having to lock up the entire file system. And this is better throughput if you have multiple processors, because basically you can have at least one write thread non-blocking per allocation group and you know so if you have uh, lots of cores available and lots of allocation groups you can get data in and out of the file system much more quickly and so this was the kind of innovation about xfs that um, sgi put in there to uh, improve throughput on their multiprocessor architectures but it leads to kind of a weird addressing issue right because you, you now need to know not only kind of the the inode number for your file but you need to know 
which allocation group that inode is in, right? And so addressing in XFS, addresses are basically now a packed structure with the upper bits of the address indicating the allocation group. And then the lower bits being the block address or inode address within that allocation group. So this would be a relative block address or inode address from the beginning of that particular allocation group. The wacky thing about this is that while yes, XFS uses 64-bit addresses, the actual bit length being used is based on the size of the file system. So the, the length of these addresses is actually based on the size of the file system. If you have a smaller file system, you're going to have shorter addresses. So the, so while XFS allocates 64 bits for addresses, it doesn't necessarily use all of that address space. And so how do you know, right? I mean, and, and this is where we begin, um, you know, needing to decode the file system, because I need to know, like, okay, for this particular file system, how big are these addresses going to be? And so, you know, as with most file systems uh, in Unix, there's a super block at the beginning of the file system that gives you information like this that you need to decode the file system. And this is where we're going to start with our, our little, uh, <coughs> excuse me, with our little friend XFSDB. All right. So I'm just going to quickly show you how you can use XFSDB to pull this information um, out of the file system. All right, so let's go ahead and switch over into the terminal. So what I what I've done here is I've got a um, a copy of friends a copy of of a file system here. Um, so I'm going to fire up XFSDB in read only mode on my evidence, shall we say here? Okay. And I want to look at the primary superblock. So superblock zero. So take me to superblock zero. So the way this works in XFS is there's a super block copy at the beginning of each allocation group. The super block at the beginning of allocation group zero is the primary super block. And then the others are backup copies if you ever overwrite the front of your disk. Okay. Oops. Uh, okay, sorry, need a little space there. So I wanna to go to super block zero. And um, XFSDB will automatically decode the super block for you. So if I just say print, it it breaks out all the fields in the super block. Um, and so let me uh, show you around here a little bit. So, um, you know, we get things like what's the size of blocks and like most Unix file systems, the default block size is 4K. Um, okay, so AG blocks. This is the number of 4K blocks that are in each allocation group. And there are four allocation groups. Okay. So um, there's a, this is like a roughly 40 gig file system. Um, so it's four allocation groups of 650,000 4K blocks, roughly. Now, down below, uh, let's see, here we go. <laughs> there we go, there we go. Okay, this number, AG block log. Okay, how many bits? does it take to count this many blocks? And the answer is log base two of this number, which rounded up is 20 bits. So what that means is the lower portion of the XFS block address for this particular file system is going to be 20 bits. So the low 20 bits of the 64 bits are going to be the <clears throat> relative block address from the beginning of the allocation group. 
Okay. Um, and um, the upper bits, everything else, is going to be the AG number. Now, there's only four allocation groups. I only need two bits to count up to four, right? Zero, one, two, three. So in reality, for this particular file system, I only need 22 bits to count all the blocks in the file system. Two bits for the AG number, and then 20 bits for the relative block address. What about inode addresses? Well, okay, so in XFS, inodes are 512 bytes big. You can fit eight 512 byte inodes in a 4K block. So you need three extra bits to count inode addresses, right? So I can get eight, eight inodes in a block, so to be able to count all the inodes, I need three more bits to count them. So if I'm looking at inode addresses, my inode addresses are 23 bits for the relative offset portion, plus another two bits to specify the AG number, and you're good to go. Wow. Now, if that's confusing at all to you, yeah, it's confusing, right? Um, Happily, as we'll see, one of the things that um, XFS DB does for you is it'll do conversions for you, right? So it'll convert from absolute addresses like sector offsets to this weird kind of relative AG block addressing that XFS uses. So, wow, thank God, because you know otherwise we're going to be spending a lot of time with a, a hexadecimal calculator figuring all this crap out. Um, so just to uh, give you a little bit more of a tour of XFSDB here, you can see here the root inode, so the inode for the root directory where we begin decoding the file system is at inode 64, right? Just like we decoded the super block, I could now go to inode 64 and print that out. And, you know, it breaks down all the fields in this file, including things like, you know, timestamps, like here's the creation time on the on the root directory. Right? The uh, other timestamps are up here. Um, creation time was added later in XFS. So that timestamp is down here. You can also see a breakdown of the the file names in the root directory, so on and so forth. So. One thing that XFSDB does for you is it enables you to walk around the file system decoding structures. Now, sometimes I actually don't want to look at the structure in this interpreted view. Um, you can always do type text before you print. And now I'm looking at it in hex dump view. So if I really want to look at this inode raw, you know, because for whatever reason, um you can you can do this in particular for things that are uh, like directory like this one um looking at um the object in raw mode can sometimes help you see things like deleted directory entries and, and things like that so um anyway xfsdb enables me to you know if i'm a file system developer to walk around and check out structures and interpret them but that's also really useful from a forensic perspective as well, if you're doing low level kinds of file system analysis. And it's also particularly useful for validating your forensic tools if you suspect they may not be telling you what's exactly right. Okay, okay so that's just a quickie for XFSDB here. So to um, give you kind of a flavor of how I use this from a forensic perspective, um, and also to kind of um, maybe teach you a little bit more about the XFS file system. We're gonna do a, a game that's a, a pretty common game when you're first getting started with uh, file system, low level file system analysis. We're basically gonna reverse engineer the file system. So imagine we're doing an investigation 
where we're doing keyword searching in the file system, right? So, we, you know, we have a list of, of keywords that are useful for our investigation, you know, maybe financial crime related or, or whatever the case. And um, we've, we've got a number of hits uh, on those keywords, uh, including a byte offset to where the uh, uh, keyword was encountered, okay? And so what we wanna do is we wanna start with that raw byte offset in the image, we wanna back all the way out until we can say what file name that keyword appears in, right? I wanna know exactly what directory and what file that keyword is in, because in general, if you find that keyword in a, in a piece of evidence in a directory, oftentimes there's other evidence near to that particular file that may also be of interest to you. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. What, we, what I've done is I've run strings against our, um, our XFS file system here. And I went looking for buried treasure. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what I'm looking for here. Um, and um, obviously treasure is not a great word to look for because it's a, it's a common word um, that hits all over the place in your file system. But I found this um, one particularly interesting. This looks like a, a physical address, you know, street address to me. Um, and so I'm sort of curious, why is there an address at this new treasure center building um, in the middle of my file system? And so this is the byte offset that we're going to start with and try and figure out what file this string is part of. Unit 123, 20F, new treasure center. Okay, so the byte offset is what you see. <laughs> I want to convert that byte offset into a sector offset. So I'm just literally just dividing that number by 512, the sector size, um, to get a sector offset. So 1759 triple seven eight okay, one seven five nine triple seven eight that is the sector offset that we're going to start with xfsdb can help me convert that address and ultimately get back to a file name okay and so that's what we're gonna we're gonna walk through here okay so i have a sector address one seven five nine triple seven eight right oops actually it's now, um, that sector offset is what XFSDB refers to as a D at or a direct address, okay? So that's the, the raw sector offset. Um, the FS block address is the normal XFS packed structure with the AG number on the top and the relative offset on the bottom, okay? And so XFSDB, can convert that direct address into an FS block address for you. But remember, the size of the address is completely dependent on the size of the file system. So you have to be connected to a particular file system to do conversions, right? These conversions only work for that particular file system because of the, the you know, the fact that the addresses are variable length right so okay so i'm actually connected to the right file system so i can convert d address uh 1759 right and i'm going to convert that first to an fs block address okay so um, there you go. In both hex and decimal, that is how XFS would address that particular block in the file system. You can also break those packed addresses down into the allocation group number and the relative block offset. So I can convert the FS block uh, address, this thing, into the allocation group number, 
so it's an AG3, um, or I could actually convert the, I, I don't have to convert it to an FS block first. I could just go straight from the D address to something like the AG block. This is the relative block offset within um, AG3. So one of the nice things that XFSDB does for you is it helps you negotiate all of these funky addresses that XFS uses and will do conversions on the fly for you like this. Okay, so we know that um, this um, sector offset uh, is at this XFS block address, which breaks down into an AG number and a relative block offset. Cool. But we can also, just to make sure that we're in the right place, we can also go look at that um, block or that sector and dump it out in XFSDB, make sure that we got our math right. So I can say, for example, I want to go to this direct address. And then print it out in hex dump mode. Right. And somewhere in here, Yep, right here, unit 12320 F, new treasure center. So here's the string that we match. So we're definitely on the right sector address. Okay. Unfortunately, um, in XFSDB, there's no way to um, dump out the raw data. You either get this hex dump view or you get an interpreted view for something like an inode, like I showed you earlier. If you want to actually just look at the raw sector, you'd have to use a tool like DD to pull out the, the actual sector. And, and I could do that for you. So this, this is the sector offset, right? Okay, so what I wanna do is, um, let me get out of XFSDB for a minute. All right, so DD, my input file is the the disk image my block size in this case is the sector size of 512 i want to skip this many sectors forward and then output one sector one raw sector and since i'm not specifying an output file it's just going to go to my terminal right so make sure you're looking at ASCII data before you do something like this. Um, and so here is the um, chunk of, of the file where we matched, here's our string, unit 12320F, new treasure center, and so on and so forth. If you wanted to do the entire block, well, we know the, um, the AG number and we know the number of blocks per AG and we know the relative block offset and you can do some math, right? So it's gonna be the number of blocks per AG times the AG number plus the relative block offset from the beginning of that AG. And you can do the same thing with DD just by doing a little arithmetic. Okay, okay so um, XFSDB has a lot of nice features, but it won't let us look at raw blocks. So for, for that, there's always DD. Okay, cool. So we, we've, we're definitely looking at the right sector, but now I want to figure out what um, file is using, you know, that, that sector. Where, where, in, where in the file system is this unit 12320F new treasure center thing sitting around, okay? So <clears throat> uh, let me get back into XFSDB here. Okay, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run a little utility in XOSDB called block get, and I want it to um, execute silently, so only uh, give me output if there's an error. Because remember, this is a debugging tool for file systems, and wow, if you leave off the dash S option, you are gonna get a boatload of um, debugging output here. Um, and I'm also gonna add the dash N flag, which means give me names. So basically what, what I'm saying here is I want XFSDB to go through and build a database of all the blocks in the file system and tell me 
not only which inode those blocks are associated with, but also the names of the file associated with that particular inode. Okay. So you give it a minute and it goes through your file system and it creates this database. And then, um, okay, so let's see, we need, once again, convert dadder to ag block. Okay. And so knowing the ag block number, I can say block use. Tell me which uh, inode and file name are using that particular block number. Oop. Uh, shoot. Uh, is it dash n? Nope. Uh, hold on. Oh, that's right. We have to go there. Yeah, that's right. I actually have to go to FS block this thing. And now that I'm sitting on that block, so that block that I'm now sitting on is associated with this inode number, which is this, uh, oh, I don't want the AG block. Yeah, I want the... I'm sitting in the wrong place. Um, I want to convert that address to uh, the FS block number, not the AG block number. Remember, AG block is the relative from the beginning of the AG. FS block is the address I want. So go to FS block. This thing. Now, let's see. There we go. Okay, so once I've got the right block number in here, so here's the block number, this is the inode that's associated with it, and here is the path name of the file that contains that information. Okay, so let's validate that. I need to mount this file system real quick. Uh, make dir mount test data. Okay, mount, read only, no exec, uh, loop. Uh, and what am I mounting? I'm mounting that, and I'm mounting it on mount test data. Hmm. Oh, it would help. I did it as roots. Boom. Okay. <clears throat> so what this is telling me is that under mount test data, user share HW data, OUI.text, we should find. Here's our address. Here's the string that we found, right? Which apparently belongs to Hipsheng Electronics in Hong Kong. So we were able, starting with just a raw byte offset, convert it into a sector offset, use XFSDB to convert that sector offset into what XFSDB calls an FS block number, the, the packed structure. Um, then we were able to use the, the block get block use functionality in XFSDB and back that out into an IDO number and a file name, right? Just using the basic debugging functionality that the, the XFS developers had created to you know, make their own development go better. So cool, right? Um, so that worked though because 
this file, oui.txt, is part of the file system, right? What if we had, you know, hit a string that was, say, in a deleted file, a file that had been unlinked from the file system? This whole um, block get, block use thing wouldn't have worked because block use is only, or sorry, block get is only cataloging blocks that are actually part of files currently in the file system. If this had been a deleted file, it would have been a block, you know, somewhere in unallocated, and there wouldn't have been a file name associated with it. So, so what about deleted data? I think is is really the, the final question here. Um, so, what happens when when files get deleted in XFS? Okay, like most modern file systems, when you delete a file, the file content is not overwritten, right? The blocks that contained the content of the file are simply marked as as available unallocated blocks but the content stays there until something comes along and overwrites those blocks the trick though is you know finding all of the blocks that used to make up that file in the file system now the file system actually tries really hard to keep the blocks in a file in order together in a single extent but sometimes that's just not possible and so you get what's called fragmentation where a file can you know be split into multiple pieces across the file system also you know having hit a string in the middle of the file we don't really know where the file begins and ends okay so what we need is information from the inode which talks about the extents that make up the blocks in the in the file okay so when the file gets deleted, the data blocks get marked as unallocated. The inode, though, gets some updates. Timestamps get updated, um, you know, to show the deletion time on the file. In the inode, the file size is marked as zero because it's deleted, and the number of extents is also zeroed out. But what's interesting is that the space in the inode that actually holds the extents is not overwritten. So you can look at the raw inode and look at the extent data and see where the file used to be on disk. So if you can figure out the inode that used to be associated with that file, you can read the extent data and piece the file back together. OK, cool. How do I figure out <clears throat> what inode was associated with the file? Okay, for that, you need to look at the directory that the file used to be in. So what happens to the directory when a file gets deleted? In Unix file systems, what generally happens is that that directory entry for the now deleted file basically gets marked as free space slack space within the directory file and to to mark that entry as slack space the front part of the entry gets overwritten but the front part of the entry is the 64-bit inode address associated with the file name what well, are you thinking well that now i'm screwed because the inode number is getting overwritten yeah but remember that while the inode addresses are 64 bits, usually that 64 bits isn't all being used. So what happens is the upper 32 bits of the inode address get overwritten with a marker that says, this is a deleted entry, but the lower 32 bits are still visible. And in a lot of file systems, the inode address fits in 32 bits or less. And so you can actually see the original inode number associated with the file name. And seeing that inode number, you can then go to that file name or go to that inode number in XFSDB, dump the raw inode, see the original extent structures, and use that to recreate the original file as long as the data blocks haven't been overwritten. And if you're interested in doing that, 
you should definitely come take my forensics class in September because that is the lab that we, we do when we talk about XFS internals is you recovering a deleted file using XFS DB. Also, frankly, to be honest with you, I've spoken about this before um, at another anti-siphon uh, webcast, and you can find it on YouTube. Um, so uh, you, can, you can do it that way too. <clears throat> but I want to give people time to ask questions. So um, I'm going to just go ahead and jump to my last slide here. There's a couple of QR codes if you want to sign up for the Linux forensics class in September or my Linux command line class at Deadwood, just um, open up the QR code. Again, uh, if you want to download my Linux forensics courseware, it's available for free from the archive.org link. Do we have questions? Give me your questions. So we didn't actually have a ton of questions. All right, I scared them. Okay. Yeah, so, and not because there weren't questions, but because you kind of answered them, like as soon as someone would say, oh, well, like the one I'm thinking of here is someone said, oh, does this have, does X, uh, Shellfish said, does this, does XFS have slack space? And like before, <laughs> immediately, they're like, oh, yes, it does. Like, yeah, so uh, interestingly, I mean, talking about slack space, most um, Unix file systems, zero fill slack space and, and XFS is a true Unix file system in this sense. So in a Windows um, file system, you have um, slack space that actually is remnants of previous files that have, have occupied the block. In Unix file systems, slack space at the end of a file is zeroed out. Um, so you don't, you, you won't find evidence in slack in data blocks, but there there is slack in, directories, as I mentioned, um, also in inodes. Uh, so th there is Slack, but not not um, data Slack like you would encounter in a in a Windows file system. Yes. So actually the same same individual now that I look up here, um, right as I said that uh, there are some other questions here. So uh, Blitz asked for the link to the September class, but Fat Man Will jumping in took care of that. So thank you for that. That link yeah. is or hit the QR code there. in the lower left here, or hit the QR code, and when it pops up, just accept everything, and uh, you're good to know. That's I, I have kids to put through college, so so please right. sign up. You know. Yeah, and make sure you use your Bitcoin wallet when you scan that because he's got kids to put. Now, okay. of course, that is safe. We wouldn't do that to you. Um, also, there were a few other questions from she uh, Shellfish here. So, does XFS underscore DB have automated file carving like NCase, or think when, or and I think, or or think, I think what they would say, or I think he when hex editor? Yeah. So no is the answer. Um, but if you want a, a file carving utility for uh, for Unix, I mean, you can always use something like PhotoRack um, or Scalpel. Or, or one of the standalone file carving tools. They work. They work fine on okay. Unix file systems. Excellent. And we got a few more questions here. We got Rebin. I hope I'm saying that not right. Is XFS the prime technology used in the Linux OS, and is it equivalent to NTFS in Windows? You know, I think if you're looking for an NTFS equivalent, it, it would have to be EXT4, which is you know the the standard baseline. Um, Unix Linux file system. Um, the XFS is one of a, a handful of alternative file systems. Um, and here I'm thinking XFS, ZFS, BTRFS, which have appeared in Linux um, and which are getting some traction. Um, so the problem is, you know, because EXT is the kind of NTFS equivalent for Linux, any forensic tool that says, you know, we do Linux forensics is mostly focusing on EXT and probably isn't including support for things like XFS or ZFS or BTRFS. And that leaves you kind of, you know, at sea with a lot of these commercial forensic tools. As I mentioned at the beginning, the only commercial forensic tool that I'm aware of that even admits to decoding XFS is um x-ways so 
right. So um, now I'm seeing, I think I was on the wrong tab, but we actually do have about 16 questions here. Some of them just scanning through them in the, does someone have the link for the deleted files presentation? So Coco said, yeah, um, what about in excess? Ryan is just full of dad jokes today. Uh, yeah, so there is a link uh, to the anti-siphon site. Allison was wonderful and actually got that up there. So if we can drop that in as well. Uh, so don't Discord can be found here, but I, you know what I'll do? It. I got it right here. So uh, I could probably find it too. I I, I just found it. Um, so I just okay. dumped it into the Discord as well. Okay, so cool. link to the slides. Uh, some of the other questions here. One, Prilly, this is not a question for Hal, but are there full scholarships for courses on anti-siphon training? It's an interesting question. Um, no, not necessarily, but we do offer many pay what you can classes and pay what you can classes are up to and including zero dollars. So if we're running a pay what you can class, and there are several of them that we run now, including with our friends over at um, Secure Ideas, uh, they run some pay what you can classes around, I think it's CISSP training. CISSP training, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then uh, we've got some pay what you can uh, for John's classes as well for um, uh, intro to security and SOC core skills. And if you really can't pay for those, literally there is an option at the bottom where you say, hey, you need tuition assistance and uh, you email us. And I think that even what I'm saying, I think is an outdated process. I think we have an automated process for that now. So, you, but either way, there's like a button at the bottom that says, hey, I, I need scholarship assistance and uh, we'll get you into those classes. You just tell us what's going on and we go from there. So um, definitely have those pay what you can classes to help people who are looking to get into the field and don't necessarily have that money. Uh, anonymous attendee asked, is there a lab like a VM for practice? And I think you covered this, but just in case people joined late yeah. in your classes, you do have VMs that you use, correct? Right. So if you go to the archive.org link that you see on this slide, there's a there's a BitTorrent link. And if you if you download the course material by a BitTorrent, you'll get a, a virtual machine with all of the lab exercises. So the, the class has 16 lab exercises plus a capstone. Um, so that's all in the virtual machine and you can download it by BitTorrent from archive.org. Nice, and I just dropped that link that's in the slides into uh, Discord as well. So I'm gonna do that to everyone in the Zoom. So that's Hal's Linux Forensics there. And going back to here, how does uh, Ajay Krishnan, I um, hope I'm saying that last name right, how does XFS ensure the integrity of its super block? Yeah, um, so, I mean, it's checksummed. Um, there, so there is a checksum field. Actually, so XFS is a really interesting file system in a lot of ways. Um, so all of the, the metadata structures, um, including things like directories and inodes, um, have checksum. Uh, blocks that are included. They are also all tagged with a unique file system GUID. Um, so if, for example, you're dealing with um, a file system that's been like, you know, completely destroyed and, and, and wrecked, you can still recover, um, you know, maybe even entire directories and things like that, um, you know, by, by searching for the, the file system GUID and, and, finding the various objects, which are all tagged with their own, you know, different magic numbers and stuff like that. So it's actually quite a robust file system, uh, in, even in the face of pretty heavy damage. Um, so uh, it's got that going for it. Okay. Uh, same individual, Ajay, uh, Ajay um, and I'm going to read it exactly as it's written because hey. one, anytime Hal talks, I'm immediately out of my depth. I can do Linux and then Hal can do Linux. Um, so is inodes are dynamically allocatable? So I think I think what they're asking is, is, uh, is yeah. are inodes dynamically allocatable? Yes, so um, another cool feature of XFS is that inodes are allocated on the fly. Uh, when, you, when you run out of inodes and you need some more, uh, XFS will grab um for data blocks by default and say boom you shall be inodes um so unlike a lot of file systems inodes in xfs are not sequentially numbered uh they are basically numbered based on their relative position on the disk um wherever we happen to to grab them now the advantage there is that uh you don't waste a lot of overhead you just you just uh, grab inodes as you need them. Um, also, this strategy 
of allocating inodes on the fly tends to keep the metadata close to the actual data. So you don't have to, you know, like on older magnetic disk drives, spend a lot of time seeking the heads to get from the metadata to the actual data on disk. Nice. Okay. Uh, Andrea Kim just typed in, in the question, my brain hurts. Yeah, that happens when we have Hal on. I totally, <laughs> totally get it. Uh, Muhammad Reza, do we run those commands online or on a forensic image? Now, he said this about halfway through yeah. for, uh, your talk there. So does that... So it is possible to, um, to do these commands on a live file system. Uh, you'll notice when I ran XFSDB, I use the dash R flag, which is read only. So you can um, run them on a live system if you're if you're doing live response. Um, but in my practice, if I'm looking at file systems, uh, at, you know, at this level of detail, chances are I'm working off of a forensic copy of of the file system. So you know, I, while I can do it live, I don't often do it live court admissibility being a thing and all uh very good so um answered that one great uh kayla sturgeon would the fs block address be like the indirect address hmm huh. um i think i know what you're getting at there isn't uh, i think you're talking about um indirect block addressing in, in ext file systems there isn't really a parallel um there the the fs block address um is is an absolute data block address within the file system so from that fs block address i could count to the actual physical block in the file system where my data exists and the same thing's true of a block address in say an ext file system um once i know the block address in ext i could i could just you know dd and skip however many blocks i need to to get to that block address things are more complicated in xfs because i have to break down that fs block address into the ag number and then the relative block offset and once i know those two pieces i then have to do some math to calculate the absolute block number which you get for free in, in EXT because EXT only uses absolute block numbers. But for XFS, you have to do this weird decoding thing to, to deconstruct the FS block address and then calculate the absolute block address to get to the block that you want. Gotcha. And she said, thank, uh, and I assume it's a she, so forgive me if I've got your pronouns wrong there, but um, she said, thank you for clarifying. So, yeah. um, so uh, I'm going to jump over to Discord because there was two questions in Discord. I'm kind of going back and forth between the Zoom here. Uh, Shellfish, again, who's uh, thank you for with all the questions. Seriously, we very much appreciate you being involved. Uh, does XFS have a file allocation table like NTFS FAT32 table? Is that the same place where you can see the memory address pointer where the deleted inode is? Ah, uh, so um, no. So, um, XFS instead basically has a bitmap where they track allocated blocks. Um, and, and it literally is a bitmap. There's a there's a there's a, a, a set of blocks that are set aside to track allocated blocks. And and basically it, it's it's a one if the block is allocated and it's a zero zero if it's not. Um, so that and that's actually pretty typical of, of Unix file systems in general. There's some sort of bitmap that's tracking the allocated versus unallocated status of the block in the file system metadata. All right, very good. Uh, let's take a look here. A couple more questions from, uh, let's see, we got that one from Shelton. Okay, Cryptic Dante, in a forensic investigation involving a suspected SX, uh, XFS underscore DB attack, what specific artifacts or traces would you recommend analysts to look for within the file system metadata or structures? And you may, you may have answered this, but in case you didn't, is there something you want to feed in there? Yeah, I mean, so an XFSDB attack, uh, I mean, so typically the things that a, a nefarious person would use XFSDB for would be things like resetting timestamps 
um, on files and things like that. Um, and so, I mean, <clears throat> I think you would look for the kinds of typical mistakes that people make when they're doing time stomping. They they set the the seconds portion of the address, but they forget to set the fractional seconds, and so you end up with you know like all zeros in the fractional seconds, um, or you end up with uh, you know a set of timestamps that just don't make sense for some reason. Like people might hit the um, the m time on the file because that's the one that most analysts look at but then they forget to change things like the creation time or the the metadata change time and so you get a, a set of file time timestamps that are inconsistent um and uh, you know just don't make sense um and so you know the the original data that the attacker overwrote is gone you know the the original timestamp is gone but you can see that there's something hinky going on um and um you know draw your conclusions based on that the other honestly the other thing is that um frankly xfsdb is not a program that uh normal users are typically going to run and so if i see uh access time updates on the xfsdb program that's abnormal in and of itself right and it might indicate to you that somebody's playing you know silly games at the low level in the file system have we lost ian hello i muted myself because oh. i was opening a soda uh, uh -huh. as, as many of you know i just got back from from defcon and you probably noticed i was drinking from one coffee mug then another coffee mug and now i've opened a soda because my my body is still craving any liquid in front of me so with, with that said uh we are at the top of the hour how thank you for everything here can you stick around just for a few more minutes i think we can probably get through most of these questions in yeah, about sure. more minutes sure, no problem. Okay. yeah but for those of you who have got that hard stop on your calendar, you signed up and said, hey, we're going to join for an hour, but now I got to get back to work. Thank you for joining us and spending some time with us here on another Anti-Siphon Anti-Cast with Hal Pomerantz. Do not forget, we do these every week. So please join us and join us for pre-show banter where we show up for about 30 minutes beforehand, get loose, talk, chat about whatever's on our mind, and then get into the meat of the issues. Also, we've got our Blue Team Summit coming up. Make sure you register for that uh, on August 23rd, uh, day of free talks, then low cost training. Uh, definitely check out all those options at antisiphontraining.com. And uh, finally, don't forget about Wild West Hacking Fest coming up in October. Tickets are selling out quickly and we'd love to see you in Deadwood. The tickets and the training are actually selling out quickly. Check that out at www.wildwesthackingfest.com. Last but not least, on the little promotional bantery things as uh, the, the many of you leave, but we got about 300 of you still left. Um, Hal's got his class on this very subject coming up on September 12th through the 15th. That's a 32-hour course you can sign up for. So if all of this is like, oh, my God, this is my jam. I wish I could get like all of this completely in my face. That's all up in your face. Do it all up in your face. Excellent. Mm -hmm. well, thank you, Kayla, for letting me know. Um, that being said, Thank you for joining us on another Anti-Siphon Anti-Cast. We're going to go into a little bit of extra innings. So if you have to leave now, we appreciate it. If you're sticking around, how we got more questions. So it's like free um, baseball. It's that's right. Yeah. Uh, I was watching a lot of Futurama while I was in Def kind of fall asleep, but I, we didn't get to the Blurns Ball episode. Uh, webcasts always feel like Blurns Ball to me. Uh, OK, so let's scroll back up here. I'm going to go back to the Zoom questions for a bit. Uh, uh, Alan Murray, so we can search sectors for phrases, commands. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read this, then we can interpret it because there's a couple fours here. So we can search sectors for phrases slash commands for deleted files that contain them. Right. So, I mean, you know, what are you looking for, right? Like, are you looking for source code? Are you looking for images, right? I mean, how you search it depends on the type of, of data you're looking for. So, like, for image files, videos, things like that, they typically have a magic number, uh, a, a sequence of hex digits at the front of the file that mark what kind of file it is, right? So GIF images, JPEGs, you know, MP4s, they all have a, a unique string of hex bytes at the beginning of the block that you can look for. Um, and that's how most file carving tools work. For, for things that are text, uh, like source code, um, log files that may not have a, 
explicit magic number, there's often things that you can you can look for as markers for the, for the particular kind of text, like uh, JSON fields and like uh, uh, XMPP data and, and things like that. Um, so you know how you search depends on the kind of data that you want. But having located whatever it is you're looking for, we can then use XFSDB to back out to the actual file. Awesome. I'm uh, I'm grabbing uh, uh, a meme here from uh, Ronner in our, I uh, I'm saying that in a right, so like, uh, R-A-H-N-E-R, Ronner is how I would say that, but if I'm wrong, please correct me. Uh, they made a little meme of you, Hal, uh, and uh, you'll see it in Discord, but it's a dog uh, drinking from a sprinkler, just firing over them. It says, me learning, and it says, Hal talking about friends. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Ronnie, if you didn't see the, the Discord, please let me know if I can share that on social media because it is absolutely perfect. Uh, with that said, moving on through the rest of the questions here. Uh, so great, we got Alan's question. Uh, Daniel uh, Silvikoff, Silvikoff uh, had just made a statement. <laughs> I guess he really liked your quote. I can see through time, uh, which uh, always makes me think of Event Horizon when they're pulling their eyes out. Like, I can see. Um, Anonymous attendee, watching this is not a good solution to imposter syndrome lull. I want to talk to that for just a split second. Yeah, okay, you go and then let me go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Hal is amazing at Linux forensics. And I, I don't want anyone to walk away from any of our webcasts feeling like, oh my gosh, I will never know all the things they know. I assure you, I've worked in security for 20 years, protecting very large organizations. Well, IT for 20 years, more like security for like 15. And... Um, I will never know everything hell knows. And I don't think that I'm a bad security engineer when I was at those companies. Everyone will develop specialties. And if I had some deep Linux question, I would go to hell and say, what, huh? And that's what you do over time. You, you learn who the experts are in the field in certain areas and you learn kind of your place in it. And uh, you find the people that want to help and want to teach. So please don't ever watch any of these and think oh my gosh i'll never be here well that's the reason they're the instructor doesn't mean you won't be someday but you'll get there so don't walk away feeling like you've got imposter syndrome walk away feeling like you learned something new and you've just leveled up so how what do you what do you have to say about that yeah i, I mean i completely agree and and i mean you know so like and i go to ian's talks and i and i and i hear him talking and i'm like Oh shit! I had no idea about any of this. Uh, I mean, so well, he's absolutely right. My like, heart incredibly. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I I know a lot about this. Like, I, I admit, I, but I, I've been doing it for forty years. I mean, so so really, you know, it's okay um, that that I know a lot about this. Um, it, you know, the problem is you're seeing me presenting the subject that I know absolutely the most about of any subject in my career, right? And and yeah, it looks to you from the outside like, oh my God, there's this like vast pool of knowledge. But you know, the reality is that's just that's just my thing, right? You have a thing. Everybody has a thing that they can they can talk about in in detail. And and you know, I can learn something from everybody in this room. And I think that's what you have to focus on, right? It's like I don't know everything that Hal knows, but I but I know this other stuff, you know, that maybe he doesn't. And the only the only mistake you can make is to stop learning, right? So, you know, learn something new. It doesn't have to be Linux forensics. I'm happy you're here, um, but but learn one big new thing every year, whatever that is. And hey, after forty years, you'll know a lot of stuff, and people will look at you and go, "Wow, you know, like." This this cat knows a lot of stuff, and I'll never know all that stuff. I'm like, no, I I started I started just like all of you. I just started earlier, right? right? And and let me tell you, I think about oh my god, I think about the first job interview I had after you know coming out of college. I interviewed for a job at AT and T Bell Labs in Homedale as a as a Unix admin, and I thought I knew everything there was to know about Unix, right? And so I blow into AT and T Bell Labs, you know, where like you know the place where Unix was created, right. um, and I'm just like so cocky, right? And they hired me anyway, thank God. I mean, because I think back on like some of the answers I gave on that interview, and I'm just like, 
oh my god i can't believe i said that what a jackass right. i must have looked like um you know and so the reality is you know god you look back over months and years and you think god i was so freaking ignorant um you know and and but over time it's like wow, I've, I've learned a bunch of stuff and I feel good about that. So feel good about it. You know, I mean, like, don't, you know, don't, don't feel bad. You just, I, you just haven't had a chance to learn it yet. Yeah. I love, I love how you said that too, because the only mistake is not learning. And so for the individual who said that, which I think that, yeah, they, they I think they were uh, anonymous here. I already said, if I already said your name, you know who you are, but, uh, but yeah, the only mistake is not learning. The fact that you're here learning and hearing it so that later you go man i don't know this but hal said something about it so let me go back and watch that webcast and you're like i got it uh, and, and i think about the things that uh, that i've learned in, in unix land i mean it took me multiple it took me multiple iterations you know on a lot of these topics to like really like feel like i understood it you know like oh, sure the first time it's just like forty thousand miles over your head and then you know gradually you get all these this context mm -hmm. to place it into and it starts to make more sense. Uh, before we get back to the questions, I was having a conversation with one of one of my oldest friends. I hadn't talked to him in a while, and he is thinking about getting into security. And it was kind of the same thing. He was saying like, oh, well, you know, I don't know where to start. I don't know that I'm so behind on a lot of these things. And it's exactly what you're saying. It's 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 40,000 feet over your head and you you start to build. It's that bell curve, right? Where it's like you start to build a little expertise. And you're like, I know everything. I know everything. And then you once you kind of get to the top that you go, you learn how little, you know, <laughs> and then you're like, oh, when it's expertise. Shoot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Right, back to the questions here. All right. So, um, uh, what about encrypted and corrupted files again from Ajay? Like, yeah, it, what about them? Um, uh, you know, um, assuming it's, you know, it's strong encryption. I mean, there isn't, there isn't a lot you can do other than, you know, get out the rubber hoses and, uh, beat your suspect right. until they, until they reveal the encryption key. You know, it, it's the classic XKCD cartoon, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, you know, like we, let's build a supercomputer to crack this encryption. You know, it's like, it's 4096 bit RSA, no good. It's like, drug him beat him with this wrench until he tells us the password you know so um yeah i mean encryption is definitely a factor um you know it, it's it's really i i've gotten to work with law enforcement uh in different cases and um you know my perspective as a technologist and their perspective as an investigator is very different right and so like i'm the I'm the people on the left hand side of that XKCD cartoon, right? Saying like, let's, you know, do all this cool nerdy shit and and figure out how to break the encryption. And and you know, their perspective is, you know, don't do all the hard technical stuff if you know just good interviewing techniques and and building uh you know camaraderie with the suspect can get them to divulge their 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 password or or whatever. Um, you know, so building wrapper rapport and and um and and you know using those kinds of social engineering techniques is often way more effective than um than technical uh means you know and that and that was brought home to me very forcefully uh in you know the, the first major cases I worked with law enforcement they're like hey how all this technical stuff is really cool but you know does it does it really move the ball down the field kind of thing as far as our investigation goes very good. So, uh, Philip did, uh, wait, hold on. Philip Didier, uh, any suggestions for a commercial tool for XFS forensics? If there is a tool you like, what is it? Yeah. I mean, the, so the only commercial tool that I'm aware of that even admits to having anything to do with XFS is the X-Ways tool. Um, a few years ago, I was working a case where some of the, the team were using X-Ways and I was using kind of my open source tool chain. And we definitely saw cases where XFSDB, which I believe was reporting the ground truth of the file system, was, was differing from what X-Ways was reporting. So I think that there are glitches, at least at that time, there were glitches in, in the way X-Ways is decoding data, particularly, um, deleted files um and so um anyway but but i mean at least 
at least they're trying. So, um, like I said earlier, you know, trust but verify. Um, but like I said, XWays is the only one I know of that even even admits to to doing XFS. Okay. All right, we got an anonymous attendee. I'm going to answer this one now. Uh, is the Linux forensics course free? Uh, as much as we would love to give it away, uh, no. Uh, well, is... okay. So okay, let's... well, hold on. Oh, oh, oh. So so let's let's be clear about this. You can download that's right all the course materials for free from the archive.org link that you see on the screen. What you don't get is me talking about it, right? But if you want to download the course book in the lab and and in the VM and all that stuff, you can get that absolutely for free from archive.org and you can do it as a self-study. If you want to hear me talking about the material, uh, which I believe adds value, um, you have to pay for it. So, and uh, as we've been flogging all along, um, we, there's a run coming up in September, um, which you can you can hear me doing my thing, but well, it costs and I, money. And I, and I think really, yes, hearing you do your thing truthfully is is worth the money, but also having you there to answer questions and and whatnot you know having the expert there that wrote it that's that's i think with any course material really what you're paying for is you know getting access to that instructor to to help yeah you questions you, so yeah you know people say oh like you're crazy for like you worked really hard on all this course material and believe me i worked really hard on all this course material um why are you giving it away for free and i'm like well because people need the information and they may not be able to afford to come to the training or they may not have time to come to the training or whatever right but the information needs to be out there but yeah, I mean, I don't, there's no, there's maybe a little bit of opportunity cost to me putting the training material out there, but look, people still come and they pay money to hear me delivering the training. So I think that's a fair trade-off. I think so too. And uh, it, so anyone who, I want to answer that question though. Anyone who's like, how, how can you give away that training for free, you know, give away that material for free, uh, people will just take that and they'll never take your course. I would counter that with um, ask anybody who's been in security for long enough how many security humble bundles they've bought and how many how many of those books they've read. Self study is great if you are super 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 disciplined. Having an instructor that's like on this date, I'm going to spend 32 hours and we are going to deep dive into this. That's just how humans work, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So it's, I, I, will, I will say anecdotally, I. Uh was invited to come out and do a private training for a, a, a particular group who shall remain nameless. Mm -hmm. And when I got there, they said, we've been through your material already. We, we, we downloaded it, we looked at it, and we decided we wanted you to come out and give it to us anyway. I mean, you know, like, and, and these were like, these are hardcore heavy hitting forensics people. And, and, you know, it was worth it to them to have me come out and, as you say, be the expert in the room and and you know uh and go through it with them so uh, you know we're gonna do just like maybe one or two more questions so if we do not get to your questions how will you be able to go over into the anti-siphon discord and uh if we didn't get sure. your sure well, people can email me or hit me up on mastodon and there you I'm, go. I, I'm happy to answer questions I mean I answer questions for random people on the internet all the time why shouldn't it be you yeah uh, right so. exactly uh, so yeah, and, and Hal's contact information is up there on the screen if you're not into going to Discord. So just a, a couple more questions here. Um, uh, Chris Carlier, Chris Carlier, how would you compare XFS to example BTRFS? Not as in rather old, uh, tried and trusted versus flashy new, and then they've got in parentheses IDM as ZFS. I am hoping all those acronyms together is making sense to you so yeah i mean so if you look at what's available in um linux other than ext right you, it's it's basically the trifecta of xfs zfs and btrfs um and and that's the order that they were created in xfs came out in from sgi in the early to mid 1990s zfs was a sun product that um i think started shipping probably late 90s, I want to say. Um, and then BTRFS is, is this relatively recent thing that came out, I want to say early 2000s. Um, you know, I don't, I haven't looked at BTRFS very closely, to be honest with you, because mostly because I've never had a case where I've had a BTRFS file system that I've needed to unpack. Um, 
uh, ZFS uh, has had a lot of battle testing. Um, it's not only was it a major product silo for Sun back in the old Sun Microsystems days, um, but the FreeBSD community has jumped on ZFS and use it very heavily uh, in FreeBSD environments. Um, XFS, as I mentioned, uh, has been through the wars with SGI uh, and is also quite popular in the Linux world. So from a from a battle testing stability perspective, I, you know, I'm willing to trust my root file system to, to XFS. Um, I don't know that Linux lets you boot ZFS yet. Um, I think ZFS is only for for non-root file systems in Linux still. Um, anyway, BTRFS, like I said, I don't have a lot of experience with it. I it it's only been around a relatively short amount of time uh, compared to other file systems. Um, it hasn't had the adoption curve that a lot of these other file systems have, so that makes me a little bit nervous. Right, like I'd rather somebody else went out ahead of me and took all the hits, you know, to their file system before I started trusting my data to it. And I, I don't, right or wrong, I don't get the sense that the BTRFS has had the, the number of hours burn-in testing that say XFS and ZFS have had. So it makes me a little squeamish. Uh, Indeed. Um, one last question here. I think we'll end on this. So uh, for, uh, let's take a look here. Yeah, I like that one. So uh, Alan, uh, let's I'm take a look here. Uh, Alan, Alan's got a couple questions here. And uh, I'm going to get one from John Moore, Ajay, Peter. Uh, we're not going to get to some of your other questions. So please, uh, you know, if, if your question doesn't get answered with this next one, uh, jump over to Discord, email Hal. He'll be able to, you know, maybe, maybe chat with you about it. So I'm going to go to this one here. John Moore. A data recovery expert, and I don't know who it is, but a data recovery expert, has stated that digital forensics tools are behind the curve when it comes to data recovery. Is Are Linux digital forensics tools ahead or behind that recovery curve, in your opinion? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a totally different mindset. Um, I wonder if that's Scott Moulton who, who, who made that quote. Um, anyway... Um, yeah, I mean, so there's forensics and there's data recovery, right? Data recovery is like, you know, uh, like my hard drive crashed, you know, like we actually had head contact with a platter or, you know, components on the controller board have burned out. Um, and that's a very different animal from um, we have a viable file system. We're just trying to do forensics to figure out, figure out what the bad people have done. Um, and it's a very different use case. And so, yeah, the tools aren't the same. Uh, so no, I wouldn't trust, um, you know, uh, forensic tools to do a lot of data recovery jobs. Now, you know, something simple where the, the file system metadata has gotten screwed up, but, you know, the data blocks are still available and I can just use a file carving tool to recover my files. Okay, you know that's a that's a very simple data recovery thing. But anything harder than that, no. I mean, I think you want you know specialized data recovery tools, and they're very expensive. Um, but you know, if you need it, you need it. Yeah, you need it. Yeah, no. There's I know a few organizations that had uh, when I was uh, doing some work. It was law firms, and when they needed a hard drive recovered, the the cost was not. That wasn't the problem. It was that we absolutely have to have yeah. hard drive. So you yeah, know, and, and sometimes it. the data is just not there. I mean, it's just right. physically been eradicated. Um, anyway, um, Scott Moulton, who I mentioned, um, he uh, teaches a class on uh, data recovery and hard drive repair, and it's it's a fabulously fun class. Like you actually like like break you know hard drives apart and SSDs apart, and and are like Frankensteining them back together with components of other drives and things like that. Um, it's a lot of fun. So, yep. All right. So, that is going to be it for us today. For the 184 of you still sticking around, and I think we oh, went thanks, extra, everybody. Yeah, seriously. Um, 184 of you still sticking around going into extra innings here. Thank you for doing so. 
uh, we, we love to answer these questions. And for those of you who did, we did not get to, uh, Hal's going to jump over into the webcasts and live streams for a, a few minutes, hopefully, maybe. Yes. Uh, 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 so. Oh, right on the phone. All right. Very good. So they're going to jump over there. So if your question didn't get answered, please feel free to throw it back into there. And of course, don't forget, if you liked all this, if your mind was blown, if you're like, I'm drinking from the fire hose when Hal's talking and you'd like to do that for 32 straight hours, uh, check in, check out their class on live on Linux forensics. A lot. <laughs> it's not 32 straight hours. I do give you breaks. No, no, it's 32 you straight hours. Yeah, four days. You get to sleep at night. It's okay. Ah, fine, whatever. Uh, but no, for uh, for for 32 hours. I think he's going to give you breaks or whatever. Uh, but yeah, September 12th through 15th. So check that out. We also have our Blue Team Summit and Wild West Hack and Fest coming up, which all of you have already heard about. But uh, with that being said, uh, for all of us who joined here, so for Velda, for Ryan, for Jason, for Brian, uh, Caleb, myself, Ian Meyer, and Hal Pomeranz, thank you for joining us on another Anti-Siphon Anti-Cast. We hope to see you on the next one next Thursday. Ryan, please kill it with fire. <laughs>